First, you know, um, I was really, I would say, reassured, and uh, it was very refreshing to see four major companies dedicated time and efforts into the neuroscience field and new therapies. Because, you know, we from the basic science have seen several pharma uh, quitting the field or diminishing quite significantly their investment. As Ismail was saying, the attrition rate has been quite high, and we also know that the price of developing uh, new drugs, you've said at 2.5, but probably even for neuroscience, it's even higher right. because of the difficulty of running those clinical trials and, and the difficulty to have very specific markers. It's gigantic numbers and so on. And I'm very pleased to see that at least two um, pharma have decided to be a bit counterclockwise and invest you know, quite significantly. I'm also intrigued by the fact that there are new players. I wouldn't say that Medtronic is a new player. They've been around, but I think seeing a very strong commitment into the neuroscience field and you know, a large uh, nutrition company saying that maybe nutrition uh, can bring a lot as a, nearly as a, as a drug or as a medical food, certainly in the prevention. So maybe the first question to the two, I would say not newcomers, but non-farmer, you know, what are the, the maybe I can start with Steve, you know, we're talking about 2.5 billion for new treatment. We saw this morning, uh, you know, the kind of fascinating results of deep brain stimulation. Do we have any idea of the cost of development of a new device into the CNS? Are we talking about the same numbers? Are we talking about the same time? Because that's one of the key things. Where do you see this kind of development into the medical and, uh, or into the med tech area? I talked about two different kinds of devices. So the first device we talked about was delivering biologics or targeted drug delivery to the brain. That's a very expensive undertaking. First of all, you have to have the right drug. And it's a d drug device combination it has to be approved as such. And so the ambiguity and uncertainty of the clinical outcome of a phase three trial is probably not different than in pharma. So it's expensive and time consuming for drug delivery to the brain. I think it has a better chance of succeeding than a pharmaceutical uh, because again, the beauty of local drug delivery is that you should be able to avoid some of the side effects that you would see with systemic delivery of a drug. And so the, a lot of these trials, my understanding is, and correct me if I'm wrong, fail because not necessarily the drug doesn't work, but it has intolerable side effects. No, it's or, actually the opposite way around. So in phase three, two thirds of the failure because of lack of efficacy. Yeah. <coughs> so it drops out earlier because so it drops of toxicity. Out much earlier. Yeah, and the toxicity is very low. And yeah. so I, I, hopefully you'll accept my argument that if you do targeted local delivery, it will be smaller doses of drug and you should have mm. less toxicity from it. Um, for electric stimulation, yes. uh, sort of electroceutical bioelectronic medicine, this is a cheaper experience. Um, we, there's, there's less uh, question about the mechanism of action. I think it, it, it's understood at some basic level. And, and so an average device that you want to use for neuromodulation probably is a 100 million, 200 million, somewhere in there to bring to market. So a lot less expensive than a pharmaceutical. In the nutrition area, you know, the regulatory environment is somewhat different. Where do you see, or do you think that if you go towards those functional food, the kind of regulatory environment would it be increased, and would it be affordable for a company like a Nestle? No, I'm sure that they, it is for a Nestle, but in terms of cost of development, will it be comparable to a, a, a regular drug? Uh, uh, you know, I think, yeah, Patrick, it's a <coughs> It's a very important question. The food industry is referred to as fast-moving consumer goods. Mm -hmm. We are designed to respond very quickly to pressure from the market, from the consumers, and we try, actually try to understand what they want. Now we are entering into a completely new territory, and perhaps initially we felt that between the pharma and the food area, there was a space that we could invest and colonize. We are discovering that this space doesn't really exist uh, in the sense that in the food arena as well, there is very tight regulatory environments. You mentioned medical food, uh, for example. In order to register as a medical food, you have to demonstrate 
that the benefit is related to the fact that a specific nutrient is missing. So even if you had positive results, but you cannot show in the very individuals that would need the treatment that there is a specific dietary uh, component missing, we would not be able to actually go forward. So we have to learn. We are in contact with the regulatory agencies. I do hope at the beginning we will have to comply like everybody else, and this is what we are doing. I do hope that the solution to this, because the answer to your question is that we don't do clinical trials like the pharma industry does. We don't do clinical trials with thousands or even hundreds of patients. Our clinical trials are one order of magnitude lower. So the key would be to design technology, perhaps profiling people, like you were saying earlier, so that instead of having 500 patients needed, we can do the same study with 10, maybe with five. Maybe the solution to all of this will be N equal one clinical trials. And we are working a lot along those lines. I'd be curious to know what my colleagues think but about it. One of the key things that was striking from your presentation is, is the power of genotyping today. And as, as you were saying, it's becoming available. It's nearly a commodity. Or you could think that tomorrow it will become a commodity. You know, do you think that really this will decrease and you know, you'll go to this, I don't know, how do you call it, precision medicine, so personalized, to the point that you know, those fields will come close? Because you know, from the nutrition today, you will also need smaller trials uh, because it's well defined and, and this will also have an effect on the cost of development. Or do you think that personalization will maybe have an opposite effect you know, uh, uh, how do you see, because that's I'm going to be critical, and my second question, maybe for the pharma people, is prevention. You know, you are more on the therapeutic area once the disease is declared. Do you see prevention with this genetic tools as a market? So I, I am the first one for personalization. I was gonna, okay, no, oh, no. No, let, let's okay. go to Anevar sure. first, right. and you'll so, come back. Um, may I comment on, on both the kind of personalized medicine approach um, and uh, a little bit about prevention. So the personalized medicine approach, at least from my perspective, is uh, an effort to get to the point of uh, greater rate of success, right? So to better understand what kind of treatment might be right for the right person. And, and one of the approaches we're taking, which I didn't get a chance to talk about very much, was uh, to actually often start trials on, on rare diseases uh, where uh, you, you know exactly what the genetic cause is, but it might be within the spectrum. So within autism, for example, uh, we have studies in autism spectrum disorders like tuberous sclerosis, where we understand the genetics better. And, and the goal there is mainly to increase the success rate. We know that there, there are big investments involved. I don't think it'll have a significant change in the cost of developing the molecule, et cetera. But if your success rate increases, in effect, your cost goes down. Um, now, with regard to prevention, um, we're very interested, at least in the idea of early intervention. So um, I'm not sure it is entirely prevention, but because that often the disorder or disease starts um, very early, it's maybe even hard to define exactly when, but uh, both in our Alzheimer's trials, uh, we're very keen on doing studies in the prodromal phase, which is before they have a diagnosis of Alzheimer's mm -hmm. disease, but they have amyloid in the brain. So there is some disease that has started, but be before the symptoms are apparent. And we're trying to do the same thing in psychiatry. Uh, there is a kind of a high-risk period in late ad adolescence where, based on symptoms, you can tell there's a high rate of conversion. So, so we're very keen on working on that space, which we would describe as, as early intervention, which we think might be a better place, a better time to intervene in these disorders than uh, treating it after the fact. Just to build on that, um, I don't think pharmaceutical development will ever go totally personalized. So for Patrick Auerbacher, this is your medicine. I think what will happen and what must happen, and that's the call that John Bell and I made many years ago, is move to subpopulations. That's contributing a lot to our failure in drug development right now. Because what we do is we take all hypertensives into the trial. Anybody who's had 140-90, they come in irrespective. And so then we have heterogeneity of why they got the disease, and so the way we try and deal with it is to use lots of patients to try and get the difference between signal to noise. So I think it's incumbent upon all of us to redo the taxonomy of human disease. If we were botanists, we're probably doing 
plant microscopic classification using Van Leeuwenhoek's microscope because it's end-stage diagnostic criteria and we're not using the molecular tools. And that can only happen by the pharma industry, governments, academia, etc., working together. And I think that's why at UCB we are leading two of the Innovative Medicines Initiative on redoing taxonomy in neuroscience and one in autoimmunity. But don't you think that, you know, we well, understand, but this is infinite to some extent. If you just look at the uh, I take an example, Parkinson's disease. Right. We have now, I don't know, probably 10 genes related. You know, so how far can you, and now you, or you look at amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, each or superoxide dismute is related. Their each mutation is a different one, leads to different symptoms to some extent. You know, so I can understand that you're going to funnel it, but at the end, don't you think that you have, if you want to be purely causative and so on, to go further? That, I understand that it will decrease your cost. But do you think that you'll be able to get it at, I would say, this meso level? Yeah, I think you'll break it into four or five category subtypes initially. But your point is, is, is very valid. What I call what you're pointing to, if you take ALS, you take the SOD1 mutation in ALS, it's only 5% of patients who have that. It doesn't mean that the other 95% don't have a dysfunction of that same pathway. What the extreme mutations show us is the pathways that cause the disease. Mm -hmm. And I think what we are moving to, and has already happened from the regulators in oncology because its genetics is most advanced, now the FDA is saying, for instance, don't, let's not talk about approval of medicines for anatomical locations. So we don't treat all breast cancer the same, but we'll say all REF1 mutants are the same, irrespective of whether you've got prostate cancer, melanoma, or, or whatever it is. So I think that's what's going to happen, is the extreme genetics will point us to the different molecular pathways that currently constitute one whole bucket, and then we'll get precision medicines for each right. subtype within that. And then as we get more and more powerful, we'll probably go and deconvolute into, into more discrete subtypes. Stefan, on the personalization. <coughs> Uh, well, a personal opinion. I, I think we are surrounded by things that we would have said were impossible 10 or even five years ago. So I actually hope, maybe I'm a bit optimistic, that we will get to precision medicine down to the single individuals. By the way, if you look at oncology, it is already the case because treatments are tailor-made per patient. And one of the reasons why they can be so in oncology is because the readouts are there. So it seems to me that another area that should be developed is the area of diagnosis. If you can have whether biomarkers or, or signals, maybe light or refringence are areas that we should develop more. Once you know whether a single individual is responding in a certain way, I don't see any reason, especially if it is a life-threatening disease, to start adjusting in a personalized way. But maybe I'm a bit naive. Maybe another point that came through the discussion is this. Several of you spoke about the combinatorial approach. Usually, pharma is not that excited by combinatorial approach, or at least that's how I've sensed, even though I've seen you know, the term electroceuticals, interestingly, was not really coined by Medtronics, but by a pharma company. How do you see... We my it 30 years ago by yes, calling yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> no, it's interesting that a pharma, you know, kind of invented a new name for something that was known, but yes. sa stating it, that this was an important part. And this is, to some extent, that was a new concept. And, and you yeah, know, knowing the complexity of brain disease, you know, I understand that pharma will always try to find the single bullet. But how is your vision about combinatorial therapy? You know, how do you see you know, the, the Mintronics. Yes, for delivery, I can imagine, but can you combine electroceuticals with drugs or with nutrition? And that also, for me, brings the question, you know, not in the five years or 10 years to come, but will you see mergers of, of various companies that have, and one, you know, maybe we should invite, invite there's an empty seat here, and I was thinking maybe we should invite a, a big data company. Yeah. You know, the Googles of the world, I do remember we had the visit of Eric Schmidt six months ago here on the campus. I always remember saying, what do you see the future of, of Google? He said, in health. So, so how do you see the evolution of this combinatorial going from, you know, the big data to the, to the device, to the electrocerebral, to the nutrition, 
or do you see the farmer going as on its route and then you know collaborating more in, in a hospital setup or do you think it integrating it yes maybe i can comment on um at least one perspective on 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 combinatorial therapy so of course, there's a classical view, which is the possibility of you know, two drugs acting synergistically. And I think for that, uh, there is uh, already, I think, a, an appetite and, um, and, and I think a blessing from regulatory agencies to kind of do those kind of studies. But I think the interesting part is really in combining pharmaceuticals with completely different modalities or bringing other kind of technologies to aid uh, effective aid the development of effective therapies. So there are two examples that come to mind which I think are very interesting. So one is kind of on, on the, in the direction of cognition. And um, so, so many of the programs that we work on or others have worked on that might address cognition in diseases like Alzheimer's disease or schizophrenia, there is this idea that you might not be able to take a pill that improves your cognition, but it might open a window that allows you to be more cognitively competent, right? So the idea is, let's say you have a molecule that works on a plasticity mechanism, and you have that together with a device that is training your mind to be able to integrate information better. And, uh, and already you know, there are studies like that, sure. not one that's approved. And I think that's one direction where it's a new kind of combination. The other is something that we're just, just uh, piloting. Uh, would that, you see it, in, you know, and uh, taking this virtual reality, augmented reality, yeah. do you see it you know, being part of a Roche or do you seeing it just you know, as a collaboration. Yeah, no, so the way I see it, I mean, the way it would probably get m implemented is, is in, in an arm of, let's say, a cognitive therapy. We would have an arm where it is combined with a technological mm -hmm. uh, element and then see whether that group, in fact, improves better than the, the medicine alone. The, the second is, is, is in terms of following patients. So something that we're just piloting is um, uh, an app for uh, Parkinson's disease. So, so we have a, a, a program in collaboration with a company called Prothena, and uh, there's anti-synuclein therapy that's in the clinic. And uh, uh, but one of the problems is that normally the patient comes in once a month and gets an assessment, walks this way or that way. It's kind of very you know, low-density data. And, uh, and cell phones are amazing devices in terms of capturing huge amounts of information at a daily level. And, um, and so we, we're trying to see whether or not we can use that to get a better sense of how the patient is doing and really have a way of analyzing data in real time. And so it, it might at least allow us to uh, design or select therapies that are most beneficial for a particular individual by having, uh, essentially using a digital biomarker along with uh, a, a, a medicine. So I think that that space of... Uh, Synergy between using technology and, and medicine is, is, is very, very rich and it's going to be rewarding. It's so we, we, we've partnered, UCB has partnered with IBM on using Watson for anti-epileptic therapy. Now, as you know, there are many, many anti-epileptic medicines that are on the market. Most patients actually benefit from combination. Mm -hmm. But right now, there's no rational base, basis for combination. So the physician uses empiricism tries one thing, adds another thing. And with so many AEDs, empiricism will take you a long time to go through all the permutations and combinations. So we ask the question, are there data already that we've collected that can pick up distant relationships? Because that's what big data does. It picks up data in the twilight zone and you know, where we can't sit down and work out the complexity and pick up distant relations. So we're actually trialing with Watson, and, and, and it's not us uh, acquiring that in-house expertise, because I think the point that was made earlier on is stick to your knitting, but get the combination through the, you know, the effective mm -hmm. person. So I think that's clearly Apple, Google, these guys, uh, Philips has already moved into the healthcare space is their biggest thing. Six years ago, they were talking to us about it. You can see how effectively, I mean, Nestle is doing it, Mars is going into nutraceuticals, et cetera. So I think everybody's moving into the healthcare space. That's one thing about the combination. I think that's going to be a major disruptive force in how healthcare is going to be provided. The other thing for neuroscience specifically, so when Roy Vagelos, you know, I headed research at Merck for many years, so followed in the proud tradition of Roy. When Roy Vagelos brought out the fact that you can take 
use molecular biology to screen for single targets, you could get high throughput. That was a strength. My argument is for neuroscience, and especially for neuropsychiatry, that was a weakness. Because neuropsychiatry doesn't work one neurotransmitter in isolation. It's the whole, it's like a symphony concert. The whole thing is perturbed. And I think by focusing on that one neurotransmitter, we're actually looking for where the drunk man, looking under the light for the money that the drunk man lost after the pub, not actually where he lost it. And I think combination and combinatorial aspects of different pharmacological agents is going to be very important in, neuro, in, in, in neurosciences. Steve, you know, one thing, I've been a little bit in the business for the last uh, 20 years and so on, but what also strikes me is about delivery. You know, the brain, we know, as you were saying, I don't know if it's God that made it, but, but it uh, you know, has this blood-brain barrier. And I'm always amazed to see how, you know, uh, uh, I wouldn't say, but the, the pharma was not always, you know, very much interested about this delivery techniques. I always, you know, when we were discussing it, you know, we'll find a way to some extent, we'll modify the blood-brain barrier and stuff. I personally still think that this is a major, you know, barrier that we have. And your technologies, and if you look at gene therapy today, you know, talking about bringing those viruses and so on, I think we'll have to have delivery tools. But, you know, why haven't you been able to, you know, I'm not saying you haven't done, but to convince more, the pharma and so on, to, 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 to get on board, uh, you know? Is it because of the invasiveness? Is it about, or do you foresee in the coming years some major breakthrough? Because I always think that this is going to be a, probably a key feature for, for developing new drugs and the CNS is this ability to specifically deliver. Look, I, I think that most pharma gets it for biologics. I mean, I've only been in the tri 14 years and during that time, there was lots of pharmaceuticals were approaching neurological diseases with small molecules with the hope that they could get enough into the central nervous system that it would work and then they wouldn't require target delivery because as, as you've seen, it, I don't think anyone in the room would raise their hand and say, I'll take a catheter through my brain to deliver a drug. But the promises of biologics, again, whether you're talking about genes, cells, I think cells are so far away that we can dismiss them for a long time, but genes. certainly genes are real. We've been delivering genes, yeah. uh, the GAD gene too, for Parkinson's disease. But genes, proteins, protein interference, microRNAs, there's not a chance that any of those are going to work in the brain without targeted delivery. And you may get away with antibodies, monoclonal antibodies, through the blood system. But I, I think that's also, I haven't seen the evidence that that's going to work. Our conversations with most of the major biotech companies, they all get it. And they realize that the, the, the reason you're not seeing more of it is that it, it, you add a completely new layer of complexity here when you now have to to navigation, targeting, delivery, in addition to the discovery of the biologic. And so it, it's timely, it's expensive, and, and ultimately the, the, there will be an arbitrage about where the value of this is. Is it in the delivery system? Mm -hmm. Is it in the drug? Who owns it? Uh, you, this has to be approved as a combination device. So if we prove that we can deliver GDNF to the Substantia Nigra with our system, someone else is going to have to go through the same process with a different system. They can't just, it's not a class effect. So you, you can't take another pump and say, well, just put our GDNF in this pump and try it. So it's expensive, it's time consuming. And these are two cultures that have never really worked well together. I, I think most people in the room know that there, there's been cycles where pharma owned devices and then they regurgitated devices. And now you're seeing, at least in the central nervous system, I think the reason that you're seeing a lot of pharmaceutical companies, not biologic, biotech companies, pharmaceuticals, why you're seeing them coming back to what they want to call electroceuticals is they realize that drug delivery in the brain's really hard, and it's a lot easier to deliver electricity there. And so, again, if you look at that list of, of neuromodulation companies, electroceuticals, uh, that are targeting various diseases, um, most of those are actually being funded by pharmaceutical companies. Maybe just, Stefan, on this commentar commentarial approach, a combinatorial, yes. <coughs> as I tried to say, my personal opinion is that it is the only way to go. And I think we should expand the breadth of what combinatorial means. Right? 
and, and include not only nutrition, technologies. Uh, I like very much the idea, this, this image of a, learned, a, a window of opportunity. You may know that there are many products on the market, uh, not only from us, but also from others, that are actually addressed for children, two-year-old. And with the product, companies also sell little devices uh, that can run on iPads, where mothers or fathers have to sit with their children and go through some type of exercises. So we don't know yet. There seems to be a positive impact. I don't know whether it is using the device or being close to parents at very specific times of the day. And eating is a very sensitive time of the day. So I, I think that all of this is uh, perhaps, perhaps the one summary for me would be to say that science goes faster than legislation. And today, the regulatory agencies are just overwhelmed by the potential of all these new strategies and approaches and cannot evolve fast enough to allow them to apply to people in a safe way. And maybe we have to sit with the regulatory agencies more and see why one of the reasons why the pharma industry doesn't develop three compounds in a row is because you have to demonstrate efficacy for each of them separately. Now, if by definition they only work if they are together, you will never get there. Maybe before opening just to, to the question to, to the audience, just the last question, You've, several of you have alluded to the potential role of collaboration with academics. And of course, there's, we're an academic institution, there are a lot of students here. Where do you see in this kind of revolution, technical-based revolution, the roles of academia and, and of industry? Do you, you know, how are you gonna try to interact? What is the kind of relation that you're looking for now and tomorrow? I know, but yeah, so we, we've um, articulated our strategy. We talk about building of super networks. So, for instance, we have a, a signed collaboration with Harvard, with Oxford, with Weill Cornell. We're about to announce one other one with a big university where we have blanket uh, collaborations. We create a pot of money. We put it down there. And it's not only that we bring the money, but we bring the money in our own expertise. And then we sit down and together we choose the projects and we then drive them. And when we've been asking for feedback, in fact, even with Brian Kobilka, we struck a, col a collaboration before he was awarded the Nobel Prize for Chemistry. I saw Brian, he visited my office a few months ago and I said, what's special about it? And he said, the people you bring. So I think in, in pharma now, we've also got very good people who can add value to it. So definitely, Academics, and we're placing a bet that the innovation is going to come from academia. The one worry we have is the following. That 67 to 75 percent of data published by academics has been shown to be irreproducible. So for us... And pharma? <laughs> we, we need to do the same study with pharma. But, but I think the reproducibility of data is very critical. So... That's why we're very selective. I mean, we have, uh, with Hilal and, 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 and your department, we have collaborations. We're very selective about who we choose in terms of excellence and in terms of trustworthiness of the data. But, so the answer to your question is, we believe we should access innovation wherever it occurs. And we're not going to be able to harness all the in innovation within our own labs. So we're talking about this open innovation model Right, but build on mutual collaboration, intellectual collaboration, and trust. So maybe I could comment um, yes. a little bit on, on what we're doing in the framework that I showed in my slide, because uh, a lot of what I described and what we're trying to do, we're doing it in collaboration with either academic groups or foundations. So in, in our efforts to understand autism and psychiatry, for example, uh, we're doing imaging studies in collaboration with the Institute of Psychiatry, uh, to look at the relationship between kind of brain activity and uh, clinical phenotype. I mentioned that we did this IPSL project with uh, Harvard Medical School. Uh, we're working through EU AIMS uh, on the patient stratification bit, uh, looking at genotype and clinical outcome. And uh, we uh, co-funded a, a series of studies on uh, kind of validating previously described mouse phenotypes of, of, of autistic mouse models. Uh, so this is something that we're kind of very much engaged in and, 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 and uh, deeply involved in. I should say one thing that I've noticed. Um, 
is when we were looking, for example, the IPS collaboration, or when we set up the thing with Nisu Psychiatry, is that it does require a, cer require a certain commitment from the institution. It certainly helps where there's this commitment to engage in a kind of a somewhat longer term, you know, two to three year study with adequate resources to carry out a pretty big, big project. Um, so you can imagine, you know, those autistic genotypes are found in about 1% of autistic individuals. So children have to screen a lot of kids to find uh, multiple individuals with the same, um, same genotype. And there, three different labs got together to work together to, to support this. And, and that varies a lot from institution to institution. I would say generally, if I generalize a little bit, I, I think that the American institutions are a little bit forward-looking this way. They're, they're, they're quite eager in, in creating these kind of uh, devices, and I think we need to do a little bit more work to, to bring it, bring it uh, to fruition over here. But I think there's, there's a lot of appetite and great opportunities for, for productive collaboration. Stefan? Academics, <laughs> you know the world. Uh, well, the, the beauty with me is that I've been on two sides of the fence, right? Several so times. when I talk to an academic, I know that he knows that, he, that I know that he knows. <laughs> I, I think the key, the key word to me is alignment. We have to find people out there that have exactly the same alignment, the same interests, so we can align ours and theirs. Um, Nestle has always been and will be even more so an open innovation driven institution. We are too small to compete with the rest of the world. We have to find the talent and innovation, like you were saying a minute ago, where it occurs. We do strive for excellence, of course. My, my 20 years in academia have also shown me that sometimes you find outstanding people in very small institutions. So the key is really not to put everybody in the same basket and try to interact as much as you can, find the right key to leverage on your strength and, uh, and, and, and certainly open the door to the talent that is out there. Steve. Well, first of all, I think we have a little different situation in the device world than the pharmaceutical and biologic world. You guys rely on discovery and your vector of innovation is bench to bedside. Our vector of innovation actually goes the other direction. Almost all of what we make at Medtronic is actually ideated at the bedside and it's invented back at the bench. So we rely on invention more so than discovery. So we actually don't look to universities for a lot of innovation, with the exception that the only university in the world that we've endowed a professorship in is EPFL. And we did that because of the applied neuroengineering that goes on here. I don't, I mean, we were just in Dr. Cortine's lab. I mean, that's applied science in the most glorious way I can imagine. And that we like, but I visit with my colleagues, a lot of technical universities around the world, but we spend less time in laboratories and more time on the perimeter of the university at all the little startups, and you guys do this as well as anyone, of spinning technology out of your university and starting it up, and that's where we go to universities to see is where the ideas have, have actually been translated into a startup. And so again, it's the nature of devices. Again, it's the beauty of devices in some ways is that we don't have to rely on a fundamental discovery usually to get a, a product. We rely on invention. And it's generally on the peripheries of universities because you don't reward people for invention. Just what is the proportion of research funds that are you know, financed outside the institution versus do you see an increase over time? Ours is increasing significantly. So right now, uh, on a billion euro budget, we are investing about, it's, it's still small, but it's increasing 60 million outside per annum. Okay. So there's, you could say, a certain general trend. Good. Yeah. That's good news for us. Yeah, let's see okay, if there are some so questions from Any you. questions? Yes. Thank you very much, guys. Um, I have, a, I guess, uh, some questions or comments to provoke some thought. Uh, to think a little bit outside the box. Um, <clears throat> so as it was alluded to earlier, um, if you look at epilepsy, for instance, in children, um, usually the way it's done is, as it's alluded to, is um, you give a drug, it doesn't work. You give another drug, it doesn't work. And um, there are side effects with these drugs. Um, but then you have an alternative therapy with the ketogenic diet um, that also works but not necessarily side effects. So the question I have is, <clears throat> why are we still looking at drugs with all these crazy side effects 
when we're trying to treat people, when it's actually doing the opposite. So this is something, just a thing to think about. And um, I guess what are the risks and the um, pros and cons of that? Um, if you guys can just talk about that. Well, Thank you. well I think at a very broad level, there are, there are a lot of very serious illnesses for which we do not have a way to treat it, either with a drug or with uh, nutraceuticals. So I, I think that it's just that we have to recognize that disorders like Alzheimer's disease, for example, or autism, schizophrenia, we do not have effective ways of treating them. And I think it's great to try as many creative approaches we can think of, pharmaceuticals being one of them, nutraceuticals could be another one, electroceuticals could be another one, and, and then when one of those uh, works effectively, I, I certainly don't think then there would be still a case to create yet another mechanism. So if, if Nestle creates uh, a food supplement that cures Alzheimer's disease, certainly we would not work on it. Stefan. Well, you gave a very nice generic answer. The question was really very specific huh? on, uh, on the ketogenic diet. I think it's a good question, and I don't have the answer. I keep asking the question to myself. One element of answer, I can give you two elements of answer. The first one is that those diets are not easy to tolerate because it is a lot of lipids, a lot of fat, and some people tolerate, some children even, tolerate it more than others and we are putting a lot of work to try to make it easier to tolerate. I don't understand why it has not been tried systematically in adults. There is only a handful of paper out there that I'm aware of, and it shows efficacy in adults as well, but it has been restricted to those that do not qualify for surgery. I, I don't want to raise that issue in a polemic way, but maybe this is also what you have in mind when you say that you want to be provocative. There is also a return on investment, the return on investment on a f of a food product has nothing to do with the return on investment of a pharmaceutical product. So it, it, it is a matter, again, of aligning interest, aligning interest of the patients, of the regulatory agency that require to allow only safely validated products, and finally, of those that take the risk, the financial risk, to put it on the market. I think this question for epilepsy will come back before the end of the year because the first studies, not ours, out there, are going to come out with efficacy in adults and we will see how the community reacts. Yeah, yeah. I think we need to be very careful here. So I would urge you not to overgeneralize. We are actually collaborating, I don't know if you know that, UCB is collaborating with you on the ketogenic diet. Ketogenic diet does not give seizure freedom. It reduces the incidence of seizures, does not give seizure freedom. The aim for epileptic therapy is to get patients seizure-free. That's number one. Number two, I tell you a story that when we did the Harvard business, uh, when, when UCB and Harvard signed, the so story of Julia Axelrod, and I know Susan Axelrod won't mind me, me telling the story because she told it. Susan Axelrod is the, is the wife of David Axelrod, who was Barack Obama's chief strategist and won the election. Their daughter, Julia, had 24 seizures a day. And when she didn't have seizures, she was crying, Mom, help me. In 1998, she heard of an anti-epileptic medicine called Capra under development. They got compassionate use. It wasn't approved in the United States. Till today, Julia is completely seizure-free. Even with a whole host of anti-epileptic drugs, 30% of patients don't even get a reduction in seizures forget get, getting seizure freedom, even if they use five anti-epileptic drugs together. So to argue that ketogenic diets are a substitute for medicines, I think is extremely naive because it doesn't have that efficacy. The third thing is, which for me was surprising, is if you look even in the United States, 25% of anti-epileptic patients are being prescribed phenobarb, and phenytoin. If I develop a new drug, he develops a new drug, the first thing we have to show the regulatory agency is we don't have drug-drug interactions like phenobarb. If we do, the medicine will be killed. Why are 25% of patients in the most sophisticated nation on earth still on this? For one very simple reason. They are seizure-free on these medications. And when you have seizure freedom, you don't swap it because even with generic medicines, Epilepsy is one area where even if a patient has a branded drug, 
and you put them in the generic, and there's 20% difference on the bioavailability, you can restart seizures again. So we need to be very careful not to draw too far conclusions on one works and doesn't work. All of therapy is benefit to risk ratio. And that's what we always need to take into account. What's the benefit? What's the risk? Okay, another question there on the right side. This is Bragi from Demir Technology. As we all know, pharma is a business of understanding. And the key technology of big data that can help pharma to speed up the pipeline is um, natural language understanding. IBM Watson represents a state of art technology in natural language understanding. However, it has fundamental limits in the sense that it can never achieve or approximate the level of natural language understanding close to be, um, reading or understanding medical journals. So my question is, to what extent have you realized that this technological gap cannot be bridged by any incremental improvement on existing AI technology? And what kind of plans and resources have you planned to place in developing the next generation of fundamental AI technology to bridge this gap? You want, you want, <laughs> you want me to take it? Look, pharma is still in its infancy at, and like a lot of other industries, at, at totally utilizing the power of big data. And I go even further to say we're not alone in this. So we're trying to play fast catch-up, and we recognize the, the, um, the inadequacies. And as you know from the IT industry, computer algorithms and computer knowledge moves at such an astronomical rate that we are drinking from a fire hose. We just can't keep pace with what's going on. So we do need more of that. But you know, the United States government, after 9-11, actually had all the information there to identify the 19 people. What they didn't have was the, the algorithm to tie the dots together. And I think that's what we need to develop together, is there's a hell of a lot of big data what we need to do is to develop the algorithms to identify these patterns and pick up these distant but relationships. Just a question on the business. Do you, will you internalize this, or do you think that you will have strategic alliances with the GAFA of the world? I think it's strategic alliances for us. Yes, if I just wanted to make a small comment uh, in addition, which is that uh, you know, this is the kind of thing that I don't think that we would have a dedicated group inside of Roche to try to solve. Uh, every day, there are people who come in with great ideas about things that they could work on with us. And I think this is one of those things that I think uh, the work that is happening out there, uh, and I hope there are people thinking about how to deal with these things, will come and bring it to our attention and say, you know, here's the technology, or here's a way, here's an algorithm that we can use that would allow you to do something better and then we would figure out how we can work with them to make it happen. So I think this is clearly one of those things that I think we're not going to but build they, internally to succeed. But the experiments have been done, Patrick. Yeah, I know. So the, I'll tell you where the experiment was done. In 1996 was the highest rate of approvals of medicines by the FDA. And we, we, we write down, and we, we're recovering somewhat, but we haven't recovered. What was the problem? In 93, people like George Post, Smith, Klein, Beecham, and others started moving into genomics and bioinformatics. In fact, George Post said, we'll hire more bioinformaticians that everybody else will need to come to us. That hasn't panned out. And in fact, what the industry learned is to try and bring it in, you can't compete at the rate that it is done, the innovation is done outside. But just to look, we, we saw recently Google had two uh, major uh, deals, at least symbolically very important. Right. One is on the uh, glucose sensing lens between Alcon slash Novartis and Google, and I think Google announced, and then maybe for Steve, you know, this alliance between J and J, I think, in robotics, yeah. uh, operating surgery, and so on. Do you see this, and for Medtronic, which is closer because you are really recording potential, you know, gigantic amount of data for your sensing devices and so on. You, do you, will you see this internally or do you think it also as a global alliance? Well, this is much bigger than Medtronic. Um, we, we for sure will end up partnering with the Googles and IBMs of the world. Uh, there's no question. So the alliance that J&J &J is going to have with Google 
is really about making surgical decisions. It's not, they're not, Google's not helping them build a robot. They're helping them by sort of developing the algorithms to how decisions are made on the fly in the operating room. And there are so many variables that I think can be improved by data handling. Uh, we're working on a, just to give you an example of how this would work, is that we plan to remotely monitor a couple million people who are dependent on insulin for their life. Uh, we have closed loop systems that are, we've written algorithms for, but th th there has to be a fail safe system in the cloud. And we all believe that that will be enhanced by artificial intelligence. So we'll clearly be working with outside people to do this. We have lots of data in our company, as you've alluded to, but it's bigger than us, much bigger. Okay, maybe last let's, question. Yeah, let's go for very short questions and short, short answers question. so we can take four of them, all of them still, please. Okay, I just want to say it was an excellent session, both in the presentations as well as the questions. Uh, one question, two comments. Question for Ismael Kola. Uh, the data you presented, uh, I suspect, was everything included, that's uh, pharmaceuticals, as well as biosimilars and therapeutic uh, proteins, uh, perhaps. But I believe, and you can perhaps uh, refute this, that for biosimilars and therapeutic proteins, the success rate is generally much higher than what you presented. Uh, that was the question. And, and the quick to... answer to that yeah. is Good. the data I showed was small molecule data. Right. And you're right, the efficacy on biologics is about 1.5 fold higher, the success rates than, uh, than, than small molecules, but it's starting to drop now also. And we think it's because of the quality, of the, the types of targets that are being used. Okay. So it is higher, but it's reducing. Two Next. comments. Uh, quick. Yes, very brief. Uh, I was very impressed, of course, with the study of the uh, Qatari population. That uh, This is uh, following up on what happened with Decode Genetics and the Icelanders, as well as some places in Italy. Uh, you're learning from uh, humans. Uh, the interaction of viruses with humans also reveals extremely interesting information. There was a group in the Rhône-Alpes region uh, with uh, Vincent Loto who mapped the interaction, the interactome between, uh, I believe it's 75 viruses and human cells, and came up with the targets that the viruses were uh, aiming at and how they impacted upon physiological function. And in addition to that, they identify the interaction sites, which are the actual, uh, let's call it, active sites for uh, effecting and giving the physiological response. And I just wanted to make that comment as something uh, pertinent towards your activities. And a final comment, which goes uh, to the uh, Stefan uh, Katsikas' comment about combinatorial. Chinese traditional medicine has been always focusing on the, uh, all the symptoms. I'm in an incubator in the Rhone Alps region that was called Kealis. And in this, uh, this uh, incubator, we found, I think it was four projects for designing pill boxes. Because in the classic pharmaceutical uh, theorem, it was dogma, it was one disease, one pill. But it's not that. As you know, it's uh, one disease, many symptoms, many pills. So you have to tell people to take many pills throughout the day. So clearly, the idea that you're pushing forward is very pertinent. It's been around for about 5,000 years. Thank you. Thank you. OK. <laughs> uh, just real quick, um, with regards to the medical technology where we're trying to do targeted drug delivery, which I think is actually, I agree with you, that's the best way, I think, to do it. Um, but then again, thinking outside the box, um, in a non-invasive way, why not using uh, methodologies such as, uh, of course, there's the micro-bubble drug delivery, and in addition to that, uh, using magnetically guided drug delivery, so that such that you don't have to put these probes inside in a non-invasive manner, and you can just... Progress in non-invasive technologies for the future? Sure. I mean, look, I, I highlighted one of them with Novacure. That's a totally external device for treating glioblastoma. There's no question transmagnetic cranial stimulation for depression probably works. There's plenty of opportunity to non-invasively modulate the central nervous system. I was really referring to, in this context, to drug delivery and biologics, but there's, you can deliver energy in all sorts of ways non-invasively. Yeah, maybe, let's not have a follow-on to that. Let's, no, let's, 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 let's try to do it afterwards. Yes. <laughs> yes. For them. Hi. Um, Thank you very much for bringing this forum to Switzerland. It has been very interesting to hear all your conversations. My question to you is about the um, bringing the drug to market. This is such a staggering amount that you, you spend on drug discovery. 
But when the drug actually comes to market, what innovative models of, and channels of funding are you all working on so that the drugs are available to the more disadvantaged populations in the world? Take, yeah. smile. take it. I, I mean, smile. I can talk yes. about. Yeah. I can talk about it. You know, <clears throat> first of all, we are now at UCB doing different pricing in different countries. So we pricing according to the gross domestic product of a nation. And in fact, it occurred to us when we did that, that in South Africa we'd be selling the drugs very cheaply, but still white South Africans have affluence greater than many other people, and black South Africans have poverty because the GDP is an average that's even greater. So we're now even trailing in five countries using the Gini index, which is the top 5% income divided by the bottom. So we're stratifying within countries to price medicines appropriately. So this is a, a novel trial project. We're piloting it, et cetera, around the world. I think this is a big challenge for us. We need to bring medicines to all people, whether they're rich or poor, not only to rich people around the world. And that's a big challenge for the pharmaceutical industry. Okay, thank you. The last... Let's get to one then, last question. So, yes. Can we go just to the last question? Sir. Sure. Uh, thank you for this great panel today. Uh, two of you are in the European Platform for Patient Organization Science and Industry. We are in Brussels looking into what is happening in the US and in Europe. Um, unfortunately, last week I was at the EU sitting at this beautiful panel of stakeholders where the EU was asking as a legislation institute what's next. So you're totally right. They are totally out of <laughs> wherever they are. Um, it's taking too long for the life, si life circles of development for the legislator to go after it. So I hope that uh, perfect forums like this are taking a lead and give bacons for the legislation where to go for. But that needs to be done, as was said before. There's empty seat what's there, where we are actually put that empty seat with some people of the big data. It has to be filled with big data because these are the people that actually can take care about the data. And the other empty seat on the right side that's not yet there should be filled with the patient organization that are right now right. doing the push strategy and not the pull strategy. They are well educated in searching for the newest developments. So the governance that is needed to get into this big data and to find the quality of the genotype and the phenotype is actually to be done with the cooperation of the patient organizations that are doing the governance to find out what's the quality of the data because rubbish in, rubbish out. If we don't find the quality data with the quality patients so that we have a, a cohort that is homogene enough to get some conclusions in our medical trials, it's again not good. So I really didn't hear about that yesterday and not enough today. So I want to have a little bit more of governance talk here that we talk about who is actually going to do the lead to bring governance into this whole talk. And I want to have two different stakeholders that are not yet very visible here, is the high literacy patient organizations that know where we are talking about, and on the other side, the big data industry that is actually really already going into it because Google is there because they're asking us many times how to go forward. We have the people here in Switzerland, in Zurich, the IBM with the Watson project. They are much better as the physicians. And they're actually going into nanotechnology where the sensors are even better as right now known, right now seen outside. I see that IBM is much further, but I didn't find as I was here, if I, uh, yes, I will use this one. Okay. I hear they didn't put it the forward. Question. So the question here is, if you go into personalized medicine, as the talk is about right now here, that we need to know it, how are you actually going to do that in practice? 
I think that's a very large question. Yeah. To let's, ask, let's, let's actually not take it as a question. Let's take it as a suggestion that's because right. we seem to have a lot of empty chairs to fill for next year. We want to fill them. We, we will bring. But I if somebody wants to make a final comment. And, and, and yes. the other thing is a regulatory. I think this is a very good. Now, just before finishing in, in one minute, I just have the last question for all of you. You know, I, I, I was very worried and I'm still worried that the industry will not invest sufficiently in neuroscience. We know that the big, uh, that's the biggest challenge. One question to all, do you have support from your top management from the CEO in neuro development or do you have to fight for it? Steve. Well, I just told you, we, we've only endowed one chair in history at Medtronic. It was done at EPFL in neuroengineering. So do you want me to make a stronger statement? I'm delighted. A second chair. <laughs> yes, yes, from the CEO and the board. CEO and the board. So, so we have support from the CEO and the board, but we still have to fight for it. You know, Roche is a company that uh, has a lot of oncology products. And uh, it's great for us, but the fact is that there's a fixed amount of R&D budget, and I have to justify why we should do neuroscience versus oncology. You, you guys can help. Good. Stefan? Abs uh, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I love it. I, can't speak I think we will stop with this very encouraging remark. Thank you remarks. to the five speakers. And thank, thank you. Thank you all the speakers. <laughs> I got a room to Zurich. Nice to see you. Okay, good. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thanks for coming.